So is my screen visible? Great, great, great. Yeah, we can see it here. Okay. Hello and good morning, everybody. Um, I'm so welcome to the session on provable security and attack models. I'm so happy to see so many people here. Usually for conferences before the pandemic, um, the first day everybody comes, the first night everybody stays late drinking, the next morning it's empty. So I see you guys are really excited to go back and I'm excited to be here as well. We have uh, six talks lined up. And the first talk, uh, without further ado, is uh, entitled Permutation-Based EDM, an inverse-free beyond birthday bound secure PRF. And it's Avijit Duda who's gonna give the talk. Avijit, the floor is yours. Sure, thank you. So uh, hi, uh, this is a talk based on permutation based EDM. It's an inverse free BBB secure PRA. And it's a joint work with Medulla and Stupita. So in uh, Crypto 19, uh, Chen et al have shown that how to construct a secure, beyond what the one secure serial random functions out of public permutations. So they have proposed two constructions. Their first construction was sum of event Mansu, where two independent instances of even one round event Mansu constructions were solved together to produce output. And they have shown that this construction achieves a tight twin by three bit security bound. And the construction is minimal in the sense that if, uh, uh, if, the, if the two permutations become identical or if the underlying round keys have become identical, then the resulting construction, the security of the resulting construction will drop down to the birthday bound. Their next construction was some of key alternating ciphers. And uh, when the underlying permutations are identical, then the construction was dubbed as SOKC1. And when the underlying ground keys were identical, then the construction is dubbed as SOKC21. In an earlier version of the paper, it was shown that SOKC21 achieves a tight twin by three bit security bound. And in the paper, uh, the authors have shown a birthday bound attack on SOKC1. However, in uh, Eurocrypt 20, Nandi has shown a birthday bound distribution attack on SOKC21. And later in FTC 2020, Chakrabarti et al. has shown a distinguishing attack on SOKC1 with the query complexity 2 raised to 2 and by 3. So uh, the question arises that can we design a permutation based PRF with a single key? And here is the construction that Chakrabarti et al. came up with in FSC 2020. And they have shown that their construction, uh, which is known as a PDM MAC, that construction achieves uh, 2 and by 3 bit security bound, and the bound is essentially tight. And they have uh, shown that how to tweak the construction to convert it to a non based MAC, which is called the PDM star MAC with a similar security bound. However, one inherent drawback of this construction is that this construction employs the permutation called both in the both direction. That means in the forward direction and in the inverse direction. And they have posed an open problem that whether it is possible to design a beyond birth of secure PRF with the two forward calls using the same permutation. Uh, to answer this question, uh, we have proposed our construction, which we call the permutation-based encrypted Davis-Mayer construction. So this is basically a Davis-Mayer construction where the block cipher is instantiated with the public permutation with the adding of suitable round keys. And this construction requires two independent n-bit keys and an n-bit public random permutation. And we have shown that this construction is uh, tight, uh, achieves the tight 2 by 3 bit security bound. Uh, it, it does not require the inverse of the permutation. And we believe that this construction can be made that uh, if you, even if you uh, replace, uh, I mean, even if you uh, make the keys identical, then also the similar security bound should hold, but that may require some, uh, you know, the, some advanced variants of the sum capture lemma. So to briefly go through the rationale of the attack on our construction, uh, we, we first check that for each value of the key K1, whether this x plus u, where u is the input of some primitive query, equals to y plus v, where v is the output of the corresponding primitive query, and x and y is the input and output of the construction query respectively, that equals to k1 or not. And for each such k1, we will construct a set sk1 that will collect all the triplets, say i, j, k, such that xi plus uj equals to k1 and yi plus vj equals to k1. This equation should hold. For each such k1, we will check whether the cardinality of the corresponding set, say sk1, is at least 2 or not. If it is, then we will check for each such pairs, i, j, k, and i prime, j prime, k prime, whether this equation holds or not. If this equation holds, then we say that the k1 is the potential candidate true key. And in the paper, we have claimed, and we have also proved that, that if k1 star and k2 star is a pair of true keys, then the probability that k1 star belongs to the set of candidate keys with a, with a very high probability, it's in the 0.687, and the probability that the cardinality of the set k 
is at least 128 is at most half. Uh, the time complexity of our attack is roughly to power 4n and uh, the number of construction queries and the number of primitive queries that we require for this attack is roughly order of 2 raised to 2n by 3. So this, this attack is basically an information theoretic attack. So uh, it, is, it remains open that how to improve the time complexity of this attack. We have proved the security of the construction using the popular H coefficient technique where we have to identify the bad events. And uh, so, so we have identified the couple of bad events in this talk. So uh, the first bad event says that if there is a construction query and a primitive query, such that the input to the uh, first permutation call of the construction query collides with the input of some primitive query. And the output of the second permutation call of the same construction query collides with the output of some other primitive query. So back to says that we have a pair of construction queries where the input of the one of the construction input to the first permutation call of one of the construction query collides with the input of some primitive query. And the output of the same construction query, that means y, it collides with the output of the other construction query. So back to says that we have a construction queries which uh, where you know this uh, the input to the first permutation call collides with some primitive query and therefore the input to the second permutation call of the second of the, of the same construction query is determined and if that happens to collide with the input of some other primitive query then we will say that it's bad and bad four is the symmetric counterpart of this event similarly we have the bad five that the input to the first permutation call collides with the primitive query and the input to the second permutation call collides with the input to the for, for some other construction query BAT6, again, the symmetric counterpart of this event. So BAT7, it says that <clears throat> we have a, a collision between the input of the first construction, uh, uh, collision to the first permutation call of some construction query with the input of some primitive query. And then the output, the, the input to the second permutation call collides with the second permutation call of the other construction query. And here also the input to the first permutation call of the other construction query collides with the input of the of input of some primitive query. Similarly, we have the symmetric counterpart of BAT7. BAT9 says that we should not expect too much of collision between the uh, input to the first permutation call and input, some, input of some primitive query. BAT10 is the symmetric counterpart of BAT9. And BAT11 says that we should not allow too much of collision between the outputs of the construction query. That means Y and Y prime, the collision between Y and Y prime. And we have some couple of bad events. Uh, so for example, this bad events is specifically, specifically required for the sum capture lemma. And the second bad event says that uh, we should not allow uh, too much of collision uh, between the sum of u and v. Uh, so we briefly go through the sketch of the analysis for uh, good transcript reliability. So here we partition the set of transcripts into three sets. In the first set, we'll classify those transcripts whose input collides with the input of some primitive query. In the second set, we classify those transcripts where the output collides with the output of some primitive query. And in the third case, where the input and output of the permutation calls are fresh. So the first two are easy to analyze, but the remaining, the, the last one is the most difficult case to analyze. So we again subdivided this case into two, two, two cases, a case N, a case A and case B. So in case A, we will, uh, uh, we will, we will uh, say, say that the set of transcripts where the input to the second permutation call collides with the input to the first permutation call. That means that we have a pair of construction query x y and x y and y prime such that this thing P of x1 plus k, x plus k1 plus x plus k1 plus k2, which happens to be the input to the second permutation call for the construction query xy, that happens to collide with the input to the first permutation call for the second construction query, namely x prime plus k1. And case B is the remaining set of transcripts. To analyze case 1, we will count the number of transcripts that will satisfy this case A. And for to, to, to count this number, we require the sum capture lemma. And say, suppose we have fixed such key input output pairs for the permutation P. And for analyzing case B, we will identify the number of good Z. So Z is basically an intermediate variable to the permutation, second permutation called P. We will identify and count the number of good Z. And then we will count the number of permutation calls that realizes the given transcript for such a good Z. So uh, the analysis for case A and case B is involved. And uh, I have not uh, explicitly given it in, the, in, in this presentation. And uh, for, for more detailed analysis, you can just go through the paper. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Avijit. Uh, please stay yeah. on the call because you have done a lot yeah, of work sure, sure, in the sure. second talk in the same session. Um, are there sure. any questions from the audience? A quick question? Yeah, Damian? 
we need to find a mic for uh All right. Thanks for a nice talk, Nadiji. I just have a quick question. Thanks, thanks, Amir. Um, uh, so, from your results, it seems like the contraction is tight, which it is. So, if you wanted to increase the security level, you would probably have to use more permutation of calls. Do you have any insights in the relation between how many calls you use versus how what the security level you get? So, uh, Damien, your voice is not so clear. So, uh, could you uh, help me, Nikki, for what, what Daniel is asking? Yeah. So, um, to quickly summarize the, the um, idea, it's like, okay, if, if you, you have a bound that is tight, if you want to extend this to, to get um, a, higher, a higher security bound, you would add extra permutations of what would you do? Like, it's, it's, it's seeing how to extend the construction more or less, right? Okay, okay go ahead. so you mean to say that... Uh, sorry. The question is if you have yeah. any insights in the relationship between how many permutation calls you use and what's the security level you get. So if you add one permutation call, what's the security you can get, et cetera? Well, uh, I think uh, for the sequential mode of operation, that is still not clear. But if you have the sum of even months of construction, uh, I believe that if you add one more permutation calls, then uh, the security will get to the power 2 raised to 3 and by 4 for the, the, this, this, this uh, part. So for say for this construction, if you add one more permutation, then I believe that the security can be uplifted to two raised to three n by four. But for sequential based construction like PEDM or PDM Mac, uh, it's still not clear. So uh, I, I do not know the results like uh, what will be the relation something like that. Thank you. But yes, but uh, if, for for this uh, this. Uh, Parallel mode of construction for the sum of events construction, it can be done, and and in fact we are we are really working on it. Okay, thanks. Let's uh, thank the speaker again. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Let's move on to the second talk of the session: provable security of SP networks with partial nonlinear layers, and it is uh, Chun Guo that will give the talk. The floor is yours. I think you have to unmute yourself and start again. I'm seeing the screen or just a window. We see your it screen. Looks fine. Yeah, it looks fine here. You can start. OK. So thanks for the introduction. The work is cooperated with Francois, Weijia, Xiao, and uh, Yu. We study a block cipher paradigm that deviates from the popular Festo network and the normal STN network. The motivation is to design block ciphers with less AND gates because the AND gates is more expensive for side channel masking and for MPC implementations. The existing attempts include the, the Zorro cipher, uh, low MC, the Hedis, and the malicious frameworks. So the central idea is to rephrase the popular SP para SPN paradigm concretely. Uh, in the SPN, the substitution layer divides the input into W chunks, and all the chunks are then uh, mapped to the corresponding outputs via an S box. But the partial SP networks removes a number of S boxes and uh, reduces non-linearity in every round. So we call the number of remaining S boxes divided by W the rate R of the structure. The soundness of these partial SP networks have been open for years. Uh, so to shed lights, we provide the first systematic probable security treatments and provide the results uh, for three settings. First, we use these assumptions for CCA probable security. They include uh, all the S boxes are the same, which is an n bit public random permutation. The five rounds are using the same linear layer T, and the T is slightly stronger than MDS. And the first and the final round key uh, are uniformly distributed. Further, we assume uh, distinguishing makes Q oracle queries, and then we can prove this common birthday bound security, Q squared divided by 2n. The CCA bound uh, has severe limitations because it's in the information theoretical setting and limited by the domain of the S box. 
But we believe the most interesting point is a fair comparison regarding the rounds needed for security. So for CCA security, a normal SPN needs three WS boxes, while the rate one divided by two PSPN, uh, it needs five W divided by two S boxes. So we confirm PSPN uh, consume less nonlinearity in a formal model. So facing the limitation on information theoretical probable security, we also consider security against the impossible differential attacks. And uh, we consider the model of Sun et al. It assumes uh, any differential with non-zero input and output differences is possible on the S-box. So it's an ideal assumption on the S-box. So in this setting, we consider four round the PSPN and prove that uh, as long as the rate is at least three, divide, three quarters, and the linear layer uses an MDS transformation, then there is no foreground impossible differential distinguishers. As interpretation of the second result, uh, there is no foreground impossible differential distinguisher when the rate uh, when the rate of the PSPN exceeds uh, three divided by four. In some sense, it is dense, unless the details of the components are considered. This positive result is better than the AS, AS light SPN. So it means uh, it makes sense to trade stronger linear layers with S boxes, and the structure, structural security may be improved by this trading. For our last result, uh, we consider sparse PSPNs with very small rate, as in low MC and Hedis. Uh, let rho be the recipro reciprocal of the rate and see this figure, for example. Here, a uh, folklore result is that uh, there always exists a row minus one round differential uh, trails with no active S box at, one, uh, at all. Then the question is how to design the linear layers to ensure a security lower bound regarding the number of active S boxes. There were, was no obvious answer, and uh, so low MC uses distinct pseudo random linear permutations. To this question, our idea just generalizes the existing idea of using MDS transformations to ensure optimal differential security in two round SPNs. The linear transformation T in the two round SPN is de designed such that every one round differential, uh, delta one to delta two, yields a code word of an MDS code. Then the MDS property will ensure a lower bound on the number of active S boxes on this differential. So we generalize this idea to the PSPN with very small rate. Uh, we design the linear layers such that a row round the differential trail could have zero active S box, but then in this case, the row differences, the row round differences delta one to delta row would yield a code word of a MDS code with very long code words. Then the MDS property of the code would ensure a lower bound on the number of active S boxes in row rounds. And then by an analysis, uh, this ensures at least one active S box in every row round differential. With this idea, we could construct an MDS code and use the generation matrix to have row minus one distinct linear transformations for the PSP. This enjoins a clear underlying mathematical principle. As a triple extension, by composing this result, our linear layers ensure at least a T active S boxes in every T row runs. This may be, while it is triple, this may be a useful starting point for MPC oriented block ciphers. Uh, for example, one could begin with an instantiation of this construction and then seek for more fine grained security analysis and refinements, uh, and this may give rise to indeed elegant and secure PSPN ciphers. Please see our full video for more discussion. Thank you for listening and uh, welcome for comments. Thank you, Chen Guo. Hi, I'm here. Can I take my question? Please. Okay, if not, I have one. So, um, in your result, if I understand it correctly, you are looking only at bit at uh, S-box activity patterns in the truncated differentials. So how do you see the impact of actually looking at the S-box itself instead of just, is it active or not active? I 
I'm sorry, can I go ahead? Do you... Okay, okay, I'll, I'll repeat the question. So, um, is it correct to say that you're looking at truncated differentials by okay. activity pattern? So you're looking at whether an S box is active difference or not active, no difference. Is, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So if you want to look inside the S box, how would it impact your result? Do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, thanks for the question. I think if you, uh, if you, if we look into the details of the S box, uh, this assumption may affect the conclusion of the second result for impossible differential. Um, I think uh, taking the details of that box and the, the linear layers into that result to refine security or insecurity against the impossible differential is an interesting future work, of course. Yeah, thanks. Let's maybe move on to the next talk, uh, but thank the speaker again. Thank you. Next talk is uh, algorithm substitution attacks and uh, state reset detection and asymmetric notifications. And it's Philip Hodge that will give the talk. Philip, the floor is yours. Thanks for the introduction. Can you see my slides all right? Yeah, perfect. Go ahead. Awesome. OK, yes. Uh, so there were two uh, main contributions of our work to algorithm substitution attacks. Uh, one was a formalism on detecting uh, algorithm substitution hey. attacks with uh, state resets. And the other one was hey, Sorry, I'm getting some interruptions here. Uh, the second uh, area was state uh, asymmetric methods for subverting uh, symmetric encryption. So an algorithm substitution attack is, a, or an ASA, as I'll refer to it, is an attack on a cryptographic scheme where an attacker substitutes a component of the scheme for a malicious version. In our case, we're mostly going to consider uh, symmetric encryption specifically. The encryption function se.enc from the symmetric encryption scheme se is being substituted with an algorithm sub.enc, which will run instead on every invocation of encryption. We call sub.enc the subverted algorithm. So the attacker in this model has two goals. The first is to recover the secret key of the users of the symmetric encryption scheme. The second is to remain completely undetected by said users. The first goal is fairly straightforward, uh, but we'll be a bit more precise about the second goal. So what does it mean to be undetected? To define what it means to be undetectable, we will use a detectability game. This is a simple, simple distinguishability game where the user U plays the role of the adversary tasked with determining whether the oracle they are given access to is the subverted or the unsubverted algorithm. If U has a strong advantage at this game, then we say that the ASA is detectable. If not, it is undetectable. Note that we use a subversion key K bar to parameterize the subverted encryption function. K bar is a secret value known only to the attacker. In 2014, Bilari, Patterson, and Rogaway renewed interest in this area and coined the term ASA. They proved this theorem, showing that a widely applicable ASA is possible. In 2015, Bilari, Yeager, and Kane improved the ASA of BPR by removing dependence on state and improved the analysis of the detectability as well. The main idea behind these ASAs was to resample the ciphertext C until the result of a PRF applied to C and K bar corresponds to correct information about a single bit of the, of the key K. In this way, the attacker could recover K after observing some number of ciphertexts and recovering that information. Undetectability follows from the unpredictability of the outputs of the PRF, making the distribution of ciphertexts indistinguishable from normal encryption. So there are two research directions that we make contributions uh, to. Philip, could you hold on for a second? Yep. So the computer is uh, suddenly rebooting. Do you hear me? Yes, I can so hear you. Please hold on for a second. I don't see any problem. So Kevin, we have a problem here. So the computer started to reboot or what, what happened? So we'll be back in a second. All right. A minute.
I suppose we should ask what operating system it was. Probably frantically trying to <laughs> figure out what happened. So this is a first. Hello. 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 Oh, be careful. Hello, Philip. Do you still hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? We don't hear you yet, so we're still working on the sound, right? Mm -hmm. I think the online participants can hear you, but you're a bit faint in the room. So, uh, yeah. Still work on this. One second still. I'm sorry, Philip. Yes. Yeah. Test. Test. Do you hear me in the back? Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, but you hear me. You don't hear Zoom. So what's the problem? I think that Phil can be heard on the Zoom, but not in the room here. Okay. I'll just call him. So the Zoom is not connected to the room, right? Yeah. Oh, I, don't, I don't know, but uh, I think it's, that the microphone should get in, right? Uh -huh. some, uh... So I think this is the speaker going out that, that uh, <laughs> might be connected to internal speakers and not to... Uh... Where, where does the microphone go? I think it's not a microphone. I think it's uh, like this cable. Um... Yeah. Can people on the Zoom hear me? Yes. Yeah, I mean, okay. we can hear yeah. you. Yes. Yeah. So how do we do that? <laughs> I think you just need yeah, this thing here. Yeah. Can you, can you say something, Philip? Uh, <laughs> Hello? Hello? Hello. Can you hear test, us now? Test. How is it? No, I think so I think I... Uh, yeah, the mic is fine, right? It's just yeah. we can't hear Philip. Test. This is Zoom. Yes, we can hear you. Maybe this one? Uh, yeah. That would make sense. Can yeah, I, can, I can hear everybody else on the on the Zoom channel, but I oh, guess... Here we have nothing. Yeah. Test, test. Can you say something? Test, test. Okay, two cryptographers walk into a bar. Right? Yeah. <laughs> no, all right. You already did that? All right. Yeah, so that Sorry. is connected. To something. <laughs> the same as system, maybe that works. Oh, what was the message that came up? Your default speaker has changed. Yeah, that should work. Okay, so that's what we want, but... So maybe, Phil, you can say something? Hello? No. Hello? Test? No. Test? No. 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 Yeah. Okay, but... yeah, well, we don't hear it in the room, no, right? We don't hear it, yeah. I think something changed from the yeah. audio yesterday. And that experiment may not be working. Oh, it's just the volume. Oh, that's maybe it's the volume, maybe. yeah. Uh, How do you get it up? Is it from Zoom or uh, yeah, maybe? I think yeah. we have to set the output for you. Not... I think it's no, okay no, now. But now, but now we hear it, right? We yeah, can you, you say something, Philip? Hello, test. Oh, yeah. perfect. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, there we go. Thanks. Luckily, some yes, people here. Hear you. Go on. <laughs> yeah, go, go along. Uh, go ahead, please. In fairness, I think we should allow Philip to back up. Yeah. So I I don't want to go all the way back to the beginning, but uh, but. Um, in any case, so I talked about a lot of the background. I think I just finished the, like everything I was going to say about the background, about how we how we define undetectability of, of asymmetric uh, or of uh, algorithm substitution attacks. And 
then a little bit about some previous results that came early on in the research area. Um, and so we had these couple of theorems that were, were similar in a lot of ways, one an improvement on the other, but basically uh, ASAs on symmetric encryption are, can, can be generally produced like, um, and, and we have these two results. Uh, but I think I'll move forward from there if that's all right um, and, and talk about some of the results that we contributed. So there, as I said before, there are two research directions that we made contributions to. Uh, the first one was that we developed a comprehensive formal model for analyzing the detectability of stateful ASAs, which incorporates state resets. And second, we developed asymmetric ASAs against symmetric encryption, where the attacker has uh, additional guarantees that they are the only ones who can recover the key K. So on the topic of state resets, uh, so far treatment of state has been inconsistent in the literature on ASAs. Uh, BPR stated in their paper that a reset of the state will lead to increased detection ability, but this increase does not lead to actual detection. On the other hand, BJK claimed that a state reset as can happen with a reboot or cloning to create a virtual machine leads in their attack to detection. Uh, this seems contradictory, so which is actually the case? Uh, does state reset lead to detection or not? So BJK in their paper uh, disallowed state entirely, defining all stateful ASAs to be detectable. Other papers have gone either way, excluding analysis of state from their formalism or including some version of state reset in, in whether a, an ASA will be detectable. So we defined the following state reset detectability game. This game incorporates the most sophisticated version of state reset that we can imagine a user having access to, the ability to reset state to any previous state in the game. So that's this reset oracle here. Uh, aside from the reset oracle and the state values that are being recorded, um, this game is the same as the previous detectability game that I showed. But this is more comprehensive than any other treatment of state reset in the literature, and it leads to different conclusions about whether or not certain other published ASAs are detectable. So in our paper, we argue that this notion of detectability is the most reasonable way to approach the question of state in ASAs. We concluded that the following two points should be heeded for future research in the area. For researchers who avoid or discount stateful ASAs, it should be made clear what detection threat model they are working in and why state is unrealistic for the ASA. For researchers who develop stateful ASAs, undetectability should be proven in a formal model, including some version of state reset, or detection methods in such a framework should be acknowledged. Our second contribution is to asymmetric ASAs. In an asymmetric ASA, the attacker wishes to have guarantees that their ASA is not exploitable by anybody else. Consider the fact that the subversion key K bar that I talked about is embedded in the ASA itself and is not securely held by the attacker. If a powerful third party were able to recover this key, say by reverse engineering, then uh, they would be able to obtain the same capabilities as the attacker, which is not what the attacker would want. The solution here is really to replace the subversion key K bar by a pair of asymmetric keys. If only EK is embedded in the ASA, then this is the only value recoverable by reverse engineering. If XK is required for exploitation, then our imagined third party cannot exploit the ASA. We call ASAs that use two keys in this manner asymmetric ASAs. Asymmetric ASAs on symmetric encryption were first suggested by BPR in their seminal paper, but they did not provide a construction. So we created two asymmetric ASAs on symmetric encryption that use the techniques from the ASAs of BPR and BJK that I talked about. Uh, the first is completely undetectable to a detector who knows EK, the embedded key. The second one satisfies a slightly relaxed condition, being undetectable to undetectable to a detector who does not know EK and secure against an adversary who does know EK. So there are many additional details and several other subtopics covered in the paper, including how our new notion of detectability applies to other published ASAs besides the one I talked about, uh, in-depth analysis on how many ciphertexts are required for key recovery, and, and a framework for generalizing modifications to symmetric ASAs to make them asymmetric. But I'll, I'll leave it at that for now and, uh, and welcome any questions. Let's thank the speaker. Thank you, Philip. Thanks, Philip, for a really interesting talk on uh, algorithm substitution attacks, mass surveillance. But of course, if you give a talk on this subject, intelligence agencies might sabotage the system. So uh, sorry for the interruption. <laughs>
if there are, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, if there are questions from the audience, I'd be happy to take them. No, actually, I have a, a quick question. It's like more of a, a philosophical sure. question. So what you explain in your paper is that um, while we assume in this model that the target themselves will not scrutinize the, the code that they are using, some third party might find out about the subversion and reverse engineer to learn the embedded key. And when I was reading this, um, mm -hmm. it seemed to me that there might be a link potentially with uh, white box cryptography where the target themselves can scrutinize the code but should not be able to extract the key. So I'm wondering if you see some right. links between these fields or what your thoughts are on this. Yeah, so uh, and not really my observations, but uh, before um, before these were called ASAs necessarily, and, and the and the the scope narrowed a bit uh, in in Bilari, uh, Patterson, and Rogway's original paper. Most of the research that they were citing uh, was um, from Young and Jung on uh, black box cryptography and the dangers of it. So there was an original paper, I think, as far back as. Uh, late 80s on why we should not be doing black box cryptography. Uh, and essentially this, this sort of model uh, assumes that the user has black box access to their cryptography and can't actually read the code, because obviously that's a way to detect that there's an ASA. Um, so yeah, that is really the connection there that we should be doing cryptography mm -hmm. in the clear in general. But you know, it's, it's an interesting model to look at even if even if theoretically we're doing white box cryptography, because that, just because everybody can scrutinize their code doesn't mean that they are. So um, yeah, there's definitely tie-ins there. Yeah, thank you. That's a really interesting observation. Is there maybe another quick question from the room? Or no, in that case, I thank the speaker again. Thank you, Philip. Thanks. Okay, now the next talk is given in person by uh, yoga master Damian Vizar, presenting Power Yoga, Variable Stretch Security of CCM for Energy and Efficient Lightweight IoT. Yeah, Damian, the floor is yours. That's okay. No worries. All right. Thank you very much for the introduction. This uh, it has been a joint work with Emiliano Giridi and Reza Rayhani Tabar. So I'll start with a uh, NIST lightweight crypto call for submissions. Nobody started on that. There's a lot of requirements there, but what I'm interested in today is that NIST is looking for authenticated encryption, which would be optimized for processing of short messages. And to cut the long story short, I'll just say there is indeed a lot of applications which do treat, encrypt, and transmit very short messages. The kind of encryption we want to apply in this case is uh, authenticated encryption with associated data. I'll just flash this here as a reminder for a few seconds. And maybe the only thing I would like to point out is that we want the decryption to, to detect forgery attempts. So that if someone tries to modify N, A, or C, we want this to be detected. And to do this, um, the encryption algorithm must grow the ciphertext. So we must add some non-trivially redundant bits. And the more bits we add, the more uh, security against forgeries we expect. The problem when we plug this back in into the context of short messages is that if we have a system with wireless communication and the messages are indeed very short, our authentication tags may become a major source of overhead in terms of energy consumption. So much so that if we weigh the impact or cost of a potential forgery against the cost of defending against the forgery, we may find out 
that it would be optimal to actually vary the amount of ciphertext expansion depending on the criticality of the messages. So if I have some messages which are you know, not that critical and I may tolerate one forgery or two every now and then, I would use shorter tags. And then for messages which are very critical, I would grow them. So now you should be asking, but Damian, what does it even mean for authenticated encryption to be secure when I'm changing the tag length for every message? So fortunately, this has been formalized in a previous work uh, in this indistinguishability notion. And without going into details, I'll, what I'll just say is that the intuition that this notion captures is, um, is that whenever I treat some message with a certain amount of stretch, let's say tau c bits, the security for the ciphertext I get is tau c bits of A security, no matter what happens with the other tag lengths, even though they use the same key. All right, so now that we have a security target and motivation, how do we go about building a naive scheme that would have this kind of security and the maximum impact? In a nutshell, what we need to do is to take something that is already used, massively widespread, and try to find a way to transform it such that we don't touch the internals of the algorithm. Um, is there such an opportunity? Is there such a scheme? You have guessed it, it's CCM. Um, and it turns out it doesn't really take a lot to transform CCM to make it secure in variable tag length. All you need to do is just sacrifice one byte of the nonce and encode the tag length uh, and put it in this byte. And that's it. This is all you need to do. And the result is a secure to be used with variable tag length. It's even provably secure. So this is what we did in the paper. And the important outtake from this ugly slide is that um, the bound doesn't really depart too far from the bound of the original CCM. So we're getting a nice new property without having to pay with a quantitative uh, security degradation. Very quickly on the proof, uh, what we used is uh, a previous theorem which says that variable stretch A security is obtained if you have already the regular A security plus a strange property which essentially says if I change the tag length, it's uh, almost the same as if I rekeyed the construction. So A security of CCM has been established a long time ago, of course, and we have proven the other property in the paper based on the observation that every block cipher call under direct control of the attacker also has the nonce and also the tag length as part of the input. So we do get this nice separation. And then at this point, we wondered, so what is the actual energy economy we can achieve with this? Uh, well, so we set up a small experiment where we use the real low power wireless sensor node and we implemented the scenario I talked about. So we had some more frequent, less secure, less critical messages, and then less frequent, more critical messages. And in one case, we treated uh, all of the messages with regular CCM using the longer of the two tag lengths. You know, in theory, I have to take the max of my security requirements if I have to stick to one tag length everywhere. And in other case, we used the variable stretch variant of CCM and changed the tag length depending on the message criticality. And what the experiments show is that with this very simple modification, in certain cases, you can save up to 20% total energy consumption, which is a lot, given that what we did is very simple. So this includes the device sleep, device wake up, operating system, everything. So this is where I stop. Uh, and my conclusion is that uh, with a relatively simple modification, we can achieve a pretty good energy savings. And uh, we can also start doing this tomorrow in theory. You can take any device which implements CCM and you can reuse this, the implementation. You can reuse the hardware acceleration if it's present. And we also have some protocols with, where this would be a very natural match. And in fact, in Zigbee, this is already specified. So that's everything from me. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Damien, for a really interesting talk. It's always nice to see a few practically oriented papers. Uh, and I have a practical question as well, and then maybe a follow-up question from the audience. So uh, as many of you may know, NIST is now reviewing its modes of operation. And in the public comments received so far, there are quite a few uh, related to tag lengths, possibly increasing the minimum tag length. 
So what, what's your opinion about this, uh, Damien? What should the minimum tag size be? Or should there be a minimum for general applications or specific applications? Yeah, thanks, Nikki. That's, I think, a very interesting question. Um, yeah, just for the sake of discussion to spice it up, I think the as long as the A scheme supports it, so if your scheme is secure against reforgeries, um, that means if I forge once, the next forgery will be as difficult, then I think the tag length should be determined by the application. So if you have a really competent security engineer who knows what they're doing and they determine that the tag length, <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, but we're talking about lightweight crypto. So if, if, if we depart on the mission of filling niches and catering to extreme situations, you know, maybe there is a market for uh, for very short tag lengths. Uh -huh. Yeah, this is a really interesting thought. Because, you know, <laughs> yeah. this is like, it's a big overhead when you think about wireless communication. Uh -huh. So I will not, I will not state any minimal tag length, which is valid for everyone. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's a really interesting thought. I guess some discussion during the coffee break will be about this. Um, yeah. So I have a question, Nikki. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so Damien, just a quick question, like, uh, can we have a similar thing for GCM as well? Uh, did, did you hear the question? No, no. Can, can you, you repeat, repeat it, things? please? Okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, can we have the similar thing for GCM? Ah, for right. Yes, that's a, that's a good question. So I think for the for the counterpart it's the same because you have the nonce entering every every block cipher call for the counter i'm not so sure about about the um, authentication tag so you would just have to explore whether no actually i don't think so i think i think the gcm uses something like ciphertext translation and so normally yes. what we have shown in the 2016 paper is that no black box transformation works, if I'm not mistaken. So, yeah. Okay, let's thank Damien again. Yeah. And let's move on to uh, Avijit's second talk entitled Improved Security Bound of EDWCDM. Also, I've been told um, like to keep your total time on 20 minutes. Um, let's try to keep this talk on uh, five minutes. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, well, <laughs> okay, let's, let's see. Try, try to um, speed up a little bit, uh, maybe skip a few slides if, to, to like get a total time of, of 20 minutes for your uh, uh, talk and questions. Avijit, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, so I'm going to present this work, Improved Security Bound of EWCDM and DWCDM. It's a joint work with Nilanjan and Kushanko. So as we know that uh, in Crypto 16, Kagiyachi and Surian have proposed this EWCDM MAC, which is a non-stress MAC that is secure up to 2 power 2 n by 3 many MAC queries and 2 power n many verification queries in non-suspecting setting. And it achieves the birthday bound security in the non-misuse setting. And the conjecture was like EWCDM was secure up to uh, 2 power n queries in the non-suspecting setting. And one KWCDM is beyond birthday bound secure. So in Crypto 17, Manning and needs to prove the optimal PRF security of the construction in the non-suspecting setting using Paterin's mirror theory. But the proof of general mirror theory by Paterin is uh, still a matter of debate. And in DCC 18, Pogliati and Surian have acknowledged the difficulty of proving the security of the construction for the single key PWCD. So there the question comes up that can we design a non-suspect MAC, BBB secure MAC with a single block cipher. And then in Crypto 18, that the et al have come up with their construction, which is the decrypted Bitcoin cutter with the Lismia construction, which is again a non space Mac, which twin by three bits non space. And it is beyond birth bound secured in the non suspecting setting and birth bound secured in the non misuse. But here, to prove the security of the construction, the hash function needs to be regular, three way regular, and the almost Zor, Zor universal. Uh, well, uh, so till now, the EWCDM and DWCDM achieves 2 power 2n by 3 many, uh, 2 power 2n by 3 bit security. So the question comes up, like, can we improve the security bound of these two constructions? So to uh, do this, we first revisit to the extended mirror theory technique, where we say that we have a system of QM many equations and QB many non equations. And uh, over, over a certain number of variables, say P1 to PR. And the goal of the extended mirror theory is to lower bound the number of solutions to the system of equation and non-equation such that uh, this uh, the assignment values for these uh, variables should be distinct. 
Well, we can cast the system of equations and non-equations in terms of a graph, where we where we represent each variable as a vertex in the graph and each equation as an uh, edge in the graph. So we represent the equation as a solid dot edge and the non-equation as a blue dashed edge. So similar like this. So we identify some class of bad graphs and we say that the a corresponding bad graph that means when we cast a system of equation and non equation to a graph we say that the corresponding graph is bad if the graph contains a cycle if the sum of the lib if you take any path of the graph and if you take the sum of the labels of that path if it comes out to be zero and if you consider any cycle in the graph that involves a non equation edge uh, so this is the uh, uh, overall result of the extended linear theory that we have proved in our paper that we have proved it for two specific graphs. One is for a general graph and one is for a bipartite graph. So for a general graph, so the number of uh, solutions to the system of equation and non-equation is at least 2 power n falling factorial s over 2 power n q m times 1 minus some error bound epsilon. <clears throat> so where s is the number of vertices, q m is the total number of uh, solid red edges. Uh, well, QC is the number of uh, edges in the component and QB is the total number of non-equation edge or the blue dashed edge. Uh, similarly, we have a result for the extended mirror theory for a bipartite graph, where SL and SR is the number of vertices for the left partition and the right partition of the bipartite graph. Uh, so to prove the security of the EWCDM, we have casted the system of equations in terms of a graph where this lambda i and the lambda i prime is the ni plus the uh, hash of the message m. And similarly, lambda i prime is the ni prime plus hash of the message m prime. We have identified a good graph and bad graph. So we will say that the graph is bad if uh, there's a collision between the tag and the lambda values. If we have a component size, if you, if you have a component in the graph whose size is at least 2 to the power 2, 2 by 3, and if there's a forgery happens due to the hash collision. So if such bad events do not happen, then we will lead up, uh, we will lead to this good graph. And then to, to, to lower bound the uh, interpolation probability uh, for, for, for a good transcript, we will actually apply the middle theory for the bipartite graph. Similarly, uh, the security proof for the WCDM, again, we can cast the system of equation and the verification non-equation to, uh, to the associated graph. And uh, again, we identify a class of bad, bad graphs where you have this component size of the MAC graph is at least five. If you have a if you have a cycle in the MAC graph, if you have a path in the MAC graph of length three whose level is zero, and if you have a uh, edge in the MAC graph whose level is zero, we have a bad MAC and a verification graph where, say, where we say that the MAC graph contains a cycle that includes a dashed blue edge. Okay, so that means it contains a cycle with including a verification non equation. We have a couple of additional bad events, and for each of those bad events, we have shown that okay, so the, the probability of those bad events actually, you know, uh, it, it, it belongs to the desired range. That means two over uh, two to the power three n by four. And if such bad events do not happen, then we lead up to these uh, good graphs. And again, we apply the meta theory for the general graph to lower bound the real interpolation probability for these good graphs. So, well, how this uh, uh, proof uh, that differs from the original DWCDM proof? In the original DWCDM proof, uh, we have, you know, uh, casted a system of equation uh, where uh, we, we represent our equation as a vertex. And if the, two, uh, if the two equations share a common variable, then we give or put an edge between the corresponding vertices. So in that setting, we have shown that the bad graph, uh, we, we have classified the bad graph that will contain a cycle. Any component in the induced graph contains a path of length at least three. And if that graph contains a cycle, that includes a non-equation edge. That is, in our case, we have slightly changed the setting where you know the each each variable represents a vertex and uh, each equation represents an edge. And in that setting, we have shown that the bad graph comes up when our induced graph contains a cycle, uh, when the uh, component size of the graph uh, uh, is at least four. And if the induced graph contains a cycle, that includes a non-equation edge. So yes, so that's the end of the talk. So I was a bit hurry, I guess. But so any 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 questions? Yeah. So, but uh, so Nikki, you 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 were, you were muted. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm muted. I'm muted. <laughs> yes. Yeah, um, Sorry, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm like, so sorry about this. Um, 
We'll have to yeah, move sure. uh, questions offline. So please contact Avijit if you have any questions. Uh, for the sake of time, let's move to the last talk of the session entitled LMDAE, Low Memory Deterministic Authenticated Encryption for 128-Bit Security. And it's Yusuke Naito that will give the talk. Yusuke, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you perfectly. We can see your thank slides. You. Maybe you can make them full screen. Yeah. Yes, perfect. The floor is yours, go ahead. Okay. So, okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to talk about uh, LMD LMDAE, Low Memory Deterministic Authenticated Encryption for 128-bit security. Uh, I'm Yusuke Naito, and this is joint work with Yu Sasaki and Take Sugara. Uh, lightweight cryptography. Uh, uh, first, I'd like to explain the background of this talk. Uh, lightweight cryptography is a hot topic in cryptography for more than a decade. Uh, the motivation is to design uh, algorithms that provide the data security for highly constrained devices. And uh, lightweight includes several meanings, low memory, power consumption, latency, and so on. And uh, the target of our research is low memory. Uh, memory size determines the overall hard cost in lightweight implementation. So by re reducing the uh, memory size of the algorithm, uh, we can reduce the hardware cost. And now NIST is uh, holding a lightweight critical standardization process for non-space authenticated encryption. Uh, NIST uh, demands for uh, replacing a space scheme such as HDGM. And uh, optionally consider the security against side channel attack. Uh, now there are 10 finalists, uh, which are designed from uh, different type, types of primitives, such as uh, decoupled cipher plantation and so on. And many candidates have more than uh, sorry, uh, than 64 bit circuit for our uh, data size. And uh, authenticated encryption provides the confidentiality and integrity of data. And uh, uh, many schemes are uh, designed to, ha to take a uh, NAS as well as the uh, key and associated print text. And the uh, use of NAS is a requirement of this right weight transaction process. And uh, NAS is a non repeated uh, initial value in the encryption. And this property offers uh, uh, several uh, beyond path bound secure schemes or uh, low memory schemes. However, uh, there are several problem problems for uh, NAS implementation, such as uh, for example, NAS is uh, uh, chosen from a tiny uh, NAS space, so if it is the uh, NAS repetition, or a uh, NAS is fixed to uh, some constant value. And uh, moreover, uh, NAS requires a non volatile memory to keep uh, NAS, which is uh, expensive memory. So, uh, deterministic authentication encryption or DAE solved uh, these problems. Uh, which provides the uh, confidentiality and the integrity of data without an ounce. And uh, so our target goal is to design a low suite, low memory and uh, 180 bit secure uh, DA scheme and actually consider a signal attack countermeasure uh, threshold implementation or TI. And we design our uh, DAE uh, using a uh, uh, Twitter block cipher because a uh, Twitter block cipher offers uh, uh, several TI friendly uh, a schemes uh, regarding the memory size. So uh, we design uh, our right, so to design uh, DAE with this code with this code, uh, we need to need to design a uh, DAE mode, raw memory DAE mode. Uh, more precisely, uh, the memory size is uh, optimal size. So that is uh, fixing the security level uh, S. The size is three S bit, which is uh, S bit key plus a uh, 20 bit internal state. Uh, this state size comes from the birthday attack on the state. And regarding the existing scheme, uh, none of DAEs achieve this goal. The first scheme DAE is designed to be uh, highly secure, uh, any bit secure security uh, when using any bit block, uh, trigger block cipher. And DAE is uh, highly efficient. It is a part of that and it has an efficient max structure. However, uh, DAE is require the large memory size, the size is uh, greater than three S bits. And uh, the remaining two schemes are not the best schemes. Uh, 
these schemes are achieve the NB security in the nonce dispensing setting. And even in the DA settings that is the nonce is fixed, uh, sorry, the uh, these schemes uh, ensure the AE schemes. However, the security level uh, falls into the birthday bound security. So these schemes require the, uh, a large memory size in the DA setting. The memory size is greater than three S bits. So we design uh, uh, MDAE the, that achieves uh, n-bit security and uh, has a 10-bit internal state when using n-bit block to a block cipher. That is uh, when uh, fixing the security level S, the memory size is three S bit. And we first uh, define the state update function uh, shown here. And the uh, state size is two N bit. And uh, the function uh, uh, consists of only uh, linear operation except for the ticker block cipher because we consider the uh, lightweight schemes. And in this function first, uh, 20 bit state is updated by explaining the data block. Uh, the maxim max maximum size is 2n bits. And then ticker block server is performed. And finally, the output ticker block server and lower part of the internal state is mixed by the linear operation. And uh, there is a 3 bit domain separation for the uh, DA. So by iterating this uh, function, we obtain a 20 bit internal state uh, DA schemes. So the next step is to design a DAE uh, with uh, n bit security using this function. So for the size of data block, uh, if the uh, data block size is max maximum 2 n bit, then the scheme is uh, fastest. But there is a two to half open attack if data block size is uh, greater than n. Uh, for example, uh, this is a one instantiation of this function. And uh, if the if a collision is formed on this uh, tick block cipher uh, from the difference of the difference delta of the tweak space, then uh, we can set the same difference to this data block. So uh, we we have the internal state collision here. So this internal state collision uh, offers the attack. Uh, attack uh, to uh, these schemes. So this means, uh, as this example, uh, we cannot ensure the n with security uh, if the- Sorry, uh, for the sake of time, time, can you maybe move to the last slides? Ah, uh, that's it, okay. Sorry, yeah, I get okay. a signal here. Okay, so this is our result. Uh, okay, so this is our MD structure. And uh, so uh, we, I propose a MDAE, a TBC based DAE. It achieves MV security uh, and it has an internal state uh, when using a block TBC or block cipher. And it does not, uh, MDAE designed to, uh, so that it is, does not require the tweak schedule in bus. And we, uh, as the underlying TBC block cipher, the, uh, we design uh, three skinny, which is a variant of uh, skinny. Uh, where the uh, three bit tweak space is added uh, to meet the LMDAE design. And uh, tweak scheme is designed so that the key schedule in bus course is small. So by combining these two schemes, we obtain the low memory DAE with 120 bit security and TI friendly. And uh, this table shows the hardware implementation result of our scheme and compared with the uh, non spaced A uh, schemes. And as you can see, uh, with, uh, with TI, uh, LMDAE is, uh, the heavy cost of LMDAE is smaller than this existing TI friendly scheme. And even with uh, TI, uh, LMDAE is uh, smaller than uh, PFB. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. Let's thank you, Suke. Unfortunately, I've been told coffee is getting cold. So uh, let's take questions offline and we have a coffee break right now. Getting back here at 10.30 for the invited talk, the first invited talk by uh, Orton Kuma. Thank you.